And I'm going to read Kent Jackson's paper. He's in Jerusalem as the academic director of BYU's Jerusalem Center for Near Eastern Studies. We solicited this paper from him, uh, knowing that he was one of a uh, few who could do this topic uh, very well. So we're very grateful for the time and effort he put into it, understand that he can't be with us today. So I'll be reading his paper. And following that, Nicholas J. Frederick, who's in the Department of Ancient Scripture at BYU, will present his, and then Justin R. Bray. Uh, the biographies of the participants are available for you on this handout, so we won't spend more time reading them. At that point, we'll have a 10-minute break in this uh, session on Joseph Smith, the Bible, and 19th century biblical scholarship, and then we'll reconvene to hear from Samuel Brown, Matthew Bowman, and then David Holland will offer uh, comments on the papers at the end. Kent Jackson's paper, Joseph Smith's Biblical Antiquity. Most of what Joseph Smith did as prophet of the Restoration was related in some way to the Bible. The simplest explanation for this is that the Bible contains the record of God's dealings with His people anciently, and Joseph Smith's career was a renewal and a continuation of that work in modern times. Joseph Smith and his ministry were the next chapter of biblical events. The earliest events of the Restoration had obvious biblical connections. The first vision put to the test things the young prophet read in the Bible about obtaining enlightenment through prayer. As a result of his prayer, he encountered the God and Christ concerning whom prophets had written since the beginning of history, and thus the first vision confirmed to him that the ancient biblical testimonies concerning them were true. This was the beginning of the process by which the Restoration proves to the whole world that the Holy Scriptures Old and New Testaments are true, as DNC 20 says. But for Joseph Smith, the first vision was also a lesson in epistemology. Ancient texts would be important for him throughout his career, but the source of his knowledge would be revelation. Even before he went into the sacred grove, he had already come to the conclusion that the Bible could not be his only source of religious knowledge, because, as he later wrote, the teachers of religion of the different sects understood the same passages of Scripture so differently as to destroy all confidence in settling the question by an appeal to the Bible. After the first vision, he was able to write, I have learned for myself, not by reading the Scriptures, but by firsthand revelatory experience. His prophetic career would not be an appeal to the Bible, but a reception of revelation on doctrines and histories that had biblical roots. Moroni's appearance to Joseph Smith has many biblical connections, not the least of which was the prophet's introduction to a sacred record that soon would be known as the Gold Bible. In addition to informing him about the Book of Mormon, Moroni quoted biblical passages to teach him about the work that God would soon bring about through him. In the prophet's 1838 history, the account we have in the Pearl of Great Price, he identified five scriptures that Moroni quoted and discussed, but he stated that the angel also quoted many other passages. Oliver Cowdery's 1835 newspaper accounts of these events mentioned 30 biblical passages that Moroni quoted or discussed, all but two of which come from the Old Testament. Those excerpts from the Bible, accompanied by Moroni's commentary regarding them, unlatched for Joseph Smith a window to the ancient world that remained open throughout his prophetic career. The early days of the Restoration also included visits to Joseph Smith of well-known biblical characters who came to give him priesthood authority, John the Baptist and the Apostles Peter, James, and John. Through the rest of the prophet's life, his ministry would continue with dozens of revelations on Bible topics, the restoration of biblical priesthoods, rites, and practices, and the unveiling of scriptures parallel to the Bible. The restoration would be a biblical restoration. We usually do not think of the revelations contained in the Doctrine and Covenants as biblical texts, but in many ways they are, because the vast majority of their content provides enlightenment on themes from the Old and New Testaments. This is deliberate because the Restoration presupposed that Christianity would be on the earth before the days of Joseph Smith and the Bible would be the means by which Christianity would be preserved and spread. What was to be restored in the latter days would be the gospel's fullness, not its general principles and beliefs, which would already be present. Among the topics of the revelations in the Doctrine and Covenants are God and Christ, 
the Holy Ghost, faith, repentance, baptism, justice, mercy, the fall, the atonement, the resurrection, judgment, covenants, temples, ordinances, spiritual gifts, tithing, the church, missionary work, angels, Satan, temptation, the last days, the second coming, and the millennium. All of these are easily recognizable as biblical concepts, and yet none of them were introduced for the first time in the revelations to Joseph Smith. Yet the revelations add significant understanding to each of them, with clarifications and expansions often well beyond what we find in the Bible. Some of the revelations deal explicitly with passages, people, and events from the Old and New Testaments. Two of them are question and answer dialogues regarding biblical chapters. One contains a new account of the Olivet Discourse from Matthew 24, and another an explanation of the parable of the wheat and the tares in Matthew 13. A revelation provides answers to biblical questions regarding marriage, and another teaches regarding Daniel chapter 2. Another fleshes out an account of uh, John chapter 21, and others provide explanations for passages in 1 Corinthians. The vision of the degrees of glory springs from a passage in John chapter 5. Biblical priesthood is illuminated, as are the lives of Moses, Jethro, Adam, Enoch, Melchizedek, and others of the patriarchs. And the Doctrine and Covenants includes an account of the actual visits of, to Joseph Smith of three persons whose lives are known and discussed in the Bible, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. And it contains reference to the visits of others. In all, a good portion of Joseph Smith's biblical education came through these revelations. But probably more of Joseph's knowledge of the ancient world came through his biblical translations particularly through his new translation of the Bible. Joseph Smith began his revision of the Bible in June 1830 and completed it about three years later. In the process of working through the Bible, he restored precious things that had been lost from it and revealed many important truths pertaining to biblical passages, people, and events. The prophet made changes, additions, and corrections in hundreds of verses. Most changes were small rewordings of King James language to make the text more clear and understandable for modern readers. But in parts of the Bible, much new material was added, as in the Genesis chapters that are included as the Book of Moses in the Pearl of Great Price. Since the late 1970s, the revision has been commonly called the Joseph Smith translation, but the prophet and his contemporaries referred to it as the New Translation. From working on the New Translation, Joseph Smith learned much about the ancient world, but none of the details are as important as the one fundamental principle that came to underlie much of his biblical teaching throughout his life. The fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ was revealed in the beginning of human history and always was the only means of human salvation. The New Translation records the revelation of the gospel to Adam and Eve. And in that day, the Holy Ghost fell upon Adam, which beareth record of the Father and the Son, saying, I am the only begotten of the Father from the beginning, henceforth and forever, that as thou hast fallen, thou mayest be redeemed, and all mankind, even as many as will. God said further to Adam, If thou wilt turn unto me, and hearken unto my voice, and believe, and repent of all thy transgressions, and be baptized, even in water, in the name of mine only begotten Son, who is full of grace and truth, which is Jesus Christ, the only name which shall be given under heaven, whereby salvation shall come unto the children of men, ye shall receive the, holy, the gift of the Holy Ghost. Adam and Eve were indeed Christians, as were their righteous descendants. Noah, for example, taught, Believe and repent of your sins and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, even as our fathers, and ye shall receive the Holy Ghost. Remarkable passages like these from Joseph Smith's reading of the Bible gave him a perspective on the ancient world that was far outside almost 2,000 years of Christian tradition. An 1834 editorial in the church newspaper, The Evening and the Morning Star, expressed Joseph's view on the gospel's antiquity. Perhaps our friends will say that the gospel and its ordinances were not known till the days of John, the son of Zechariah, in the days of Herod, the king of Judea. But we will look here at this point. For our own part, we cannot believe that the ancients in all ages were so ignorant of the system of heaven as many suppose, since all that were ever saved were saved through the power of this great plan of redemption, as much so before the coming of Christ as since. 
For Joseph Smith, this was one of the basic principles of the human experience. Salvation through all of history has been only in Jesus. If not, God has had different plans in operation, if we may so express it, to bring men back to dwell with himself. And this we cannot believe, said Joseph Smith, since there has been no change in the constitution of man since he fell. The gospel, we are told, was preached to Abraham. We would like to be informed in what name the gospel was then preached, whether it was in the name of Christ or some other name. If in any other name, was it the gospel? And if it was the gospel, and that preached in the name of Christ, had it any ordinances? If not, was it the gospel? If it had, what were they? Joseph Smith had already learned from the Book of Mormon that ancient worshipers of Jesus offered sacrifices in anticipation of his coming. He did not view this as incongruous, but in harmony with the real purpose of the sacrifices, which served, as we said before, to open their eyes and enable them to look forward to the time of the coming of the Savior and to rejoice in his redemption. In doing so, they learned to rely upon him alone as the author of their salvation. These beliefs were virtually unique in Joseph Smith's generation, particularly the idea that the Christian gospel was revealed at the beginning to Adam and Eve making it the first religion in human history. But this is a thread that runs not only through the scriptures he brought forth, but also through his interpretation of the Old and New Testaments. Animal sacrifice, as the prophet learned in the New Translation, was a similitude of the sacrifice of the only begotten of the Father, which is full of grace and truth. The sacrifices undertaken by Abraham and other saints in antiquity were not, like those of their contemporaries, to provide food for their hungry gods, but to look to the future in which the true God, Jesus Christ, would sacrifice himself for the blessing of all humankind. And thus Abraham looked forth and saw the days of the Son of Man and was glad. In Joseph Smith's view of biblical antiquity, there was a fundamental difference between the worship of believers before the time of Moses and Israel's religion thereafter. His belief in a Christian context for the stories in Genesis rewrites that book in a dramatic way. But his understanding of the law of Moses and its origin rewrites the rest of the Old Testament and the New Testament as well. The prophet's revision of the Bible shows that as a result of Israel's rebellion that culminated in the golden calf incident, the Lord said, I will take away the priesthood out of their midst. Therefore, my holy order and the ordinances thereof shall not go before them. Thus, God took from Israel the everlasting covenant of the holy priesthood. As a consequence of rebellion, the Melchizedek priesthood and its blessings were withdrawn, and the law of Moses was instituted, governed by the diminished authority of the Aaronic priesthood. Joseph Smith started arriving at the relevant passages in the New Translation sometime in the summer or fall of 1832. In September of that year, he received a revelation that provided additional information to understand the story. The Israelites hardened their hearts, so God took Moses out of their midst and the holy priesthood also. In place of the Melchizedek priesthood, he left the lesser priesthood, which the Lord in his wrath caused to continue with the house of Aaron among the children of Israel until John. Latter-day Saints read the Bible with a view of ancient history informed by Joseph Smith's revelations and his reading of the Bible. Together, those sources give a view of the ancient world and its history that con contrasts dramatically with traditional Christian views. To Joseph Smith, however, his esoteric interpretation of the Bible came naturally from the text and was not something he imposed on it. We teach nothing but what the Bible teaches, he said. We believe nothing but what is to be found in this book. Indeed, in it the Mormon faith is to be found. Yet again, he knew that the source of his interpretation was not the text itself, but the revelation he received to guide him to understand it. God may correct the scripture by me, and if he choose, he said, if he choose, and I have the oldest book in the world and the Holy Ghost. I thank God for the old book, but more for the Holy Ghost. In 1994, I, Brother Jackson, Kent Jackson, published a book called Joseph Smith's Commentary on the Bible. For it, I collected all of the known commentary on biblical passages that the prophet gave in his sermons and writings. One thing that characterizes those excerpts is how freely they flowed from the prophet's consciousness, even if they might not seem to others to flow freely from the text. I know of no instance in which Joseph Smith turned to a printed commentary to help him understand a biblical text. 
Some of his interpretations may not have been unique or may have agreed with the views of others, but those are exceptions. And further, none of that is to the point. Joseph Smith believed that he understood the Bible as it was meant to be understood, and he taught it that way. If Joseph Smith's primary hermeneutic was the antiquity of and the universal need for Christ's gospel, his secondary interpretive principle was that his own prophetic work continued that of the prophets of the past. Even more so, the work in which he was engaged was the very culmination of the efforts of all the prophets before him. His was the dispensation of the fullness of times, when all things shall be restored as spoken of by all the holy prophets since the world began. For in it will take place the glorious fulfillment of the promises made to the fathers. Indeed, the dispensation of the fullness of times will bring to light the things that have been revealed in all former dispensations, also other things that have not been before revealed. Remarkably, Joseph Smith's revelations and translations shed light by name on virtually every important character mentioned in the Bible, forging a link between them and him. And they, in turn, looked forward to his time and the work he would do. That work, he wrote, was a cause that has interested the people of God in every age. It is a theme upon which prophets, priests, and kings have dwelt with per peculiar delight. They have looked forward with joyful anticipation to the day in which we lived, and fired with heavenly and joyful anticipations, they have sung and written and prophesied of this our day, but they died without the sight. We, Joseph Smith speaking, are the favored people that God has made choice of to bring about the latter-day glory. It is left for us to see, participate in, and help to roll forward the latter-day glory. The dispensation of the fullness of times, when God will gather together all things that are in heaven and all things that are upon the earth, even in one, and all things, whether in heaven or on earth, will be in one, even in Christ. And that's the end of Kent Jackson's paper.